existed all the time prior to their distinction in a process in language. Uh, and so I think education, uh, and this is partly what the, the reason for educating uh, design and systemic designers is that we need to um, recover our systemic sensibilities. Often our educational systems, and there was some discussion about that earlier, uh, uh, drive out our systemic sensibilities. We lose them in the process of education. And as again, Mike said this morning, uh, there's very little investment in building systems literacy, which is one of the great reasons for having this sort of conversation, because it is a conversation about building systems literacy. And uh, in our work at the AU, we want to go beyond sensibility of literacy into systems thinking and practice capability, which is your exactly what you're embarking on. And then how do you deploy this systemic and designer capability to transform the lives of people that you're concerned? Thank you. Can I pick yep. up on yep. the phrase point? So I was also reflecting because I've not I've not been involved in teaching systems, you know, over a long time. And I'm, you know, I'm kind of new to it in a way, but reflecting on the types of people that I work with who who kind of are developing systems, thinking and, and kind of training in that area, these people come to it later in life, like you said. I don't think it's something that you arrive at, you know, when you're choosing which university, which course for your sent to you, you know, is, is it going to be up there as something that you think, oh, I'm going to be a systemic designer, you know, when I, so it, it's sort of something that I think comes on a life journey where you, you start to make sense of it in the context of life experiences. Um, and therefore, I think the challenges are, you know, at what level do you start to introduce the type of thinking and at what point does it become a thing on its own? Yeah. So, Can I come in there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it comes back to the question of how you design your curriculum. Uh, the design of the curriculum as a set of structured lectures and programs at the University of Sydney to very fine undergraduates. Uh, it was impossible to get them to think systemically or to even acknowledge or engage with what we might call wicked problems or complex issues. Their, their secondary education and their, their belief that they knew what was right drove them away from that. But on the other hand, at my or, University before that, we designed a curriculum built around experiential learning and had an on farm uh, period where the undergraduate students worked, worked with the farmers for six months and they had to come back and prepare and produce a situation improving project report. They had to actually transform that situation for that farming family. Okay. So it depends on, yeah, okay. That's interesting. There are probably some universities or some schools that are more adventurous in trying those things. But I, I kind of agree with Rebecca that we didn't actually close down uh, human factors under the program because A level students, they're not, I mean, human factor has elements of the system thinking there, but they, they don't know what it is. They're not applying for that. So we have to, we have to close it down, unfortunately. But still, postgraduate is going very strong. But from my more kind of a research um, uh, kind of perspective, because um, I'm, as Cecilia already mentioned, that I'm, I'm working in the healthcare field, which has particular view on evidence, what is the knowledge. And when uh, Ray mentioned that this is system thinking practice. So, practitioners' understanding about what is evidence and knowledge could be quite different from you know, some scientists uh, think about what is, what is knowledge and evidence. So. It's a, it's a kind of a, a battle. I mean, the Mike mentioned that you have to be stubborn, just keep going. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a long process and you have to uh, find someone who understand where we are coming from and then you have to work, work with them. And uh, whenever we say about you know, this system approach, they are saying, what is the evidence of the effectiveness of the efficacy of those approach in healthcare? Do you have, any, have you done any systemic literature review on that? What is, have you done any randomized control trial and using this system approach and then see the effect in the patient? So that kind of question we always uh, asked. Then actually one of my colleagues in Cambridge, he has done systemic literature on systems approach in healthcare to prove that, okay. But I, I said, don't do that. Maybe it's impossible to have evidence for that because 
systems approach is here. And then from the systems approach, there is a mindset change, there's the intervention, and then there's a impact on outcomes and then it's a long process and you never be able to you know get the literature on that but he wanted to demonstrate that uh, it is impossible so he published the paper on bmj open but still it's an ongoing battle in healthcare to to show that it's not there are different types of knowledge and evidence you can you can uh, uh you know use uh, to improve the system so that's kind of challenge and then we already mentioned about so what uh, then the, uh, what uh, system design would look like, um, and any, any general suggestion about how do we move uh, this issue forward? Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, you're putting your finger on a very big issue, um, and uh, the boat trap to fall into, as you uh, alluded to, is is to use one model of causality uh, to explain a completely different model, model of causality. I mean, our work, we would distinguish between systemic thinking and practice and systematic or uh, reductionist or mechanistic thinking and practice. But understand them as a duality. The duality is a pair that create a whole. I mean, there are places for systematic linear thinking moments of stationarity, but we're living in a world that is, is far from stationarity in these uh, terms and there's just unfolding and growing complexity and uncertainty. Uh, so that requires different ways of knowing. I've done a lot of research on river catchment governance and, and those issues and the classic sort of response to knowledge in that domain is that we name the problem, uh, we uh, gain fixed knowledge about the problem, or we invest in a market mechanisms, or we educate, and we try and do something about the problem. And that is the linear knowledge transfer, knowledge uh, production model that permeates our universities. Whereas uh, the work we've been doing is on social learning, which recognizing recognizes that different people need to come together and engage in a process of uh, constructing what is at issue as a social process in which people's understandings and practices and social relations change and uh, out of which arises the name uh, change or transformation we want to affect and builds in evaluation as you go. And so these are, these are uh, processes and approaches to governance of rivers uh, which are fundamentally different and require different sorts of skills and practices. Uh, but there's also one other element, I think, which we can come back to the relationship between design and, uh, and systems. Uh, one is an institutional issue, which I've mentioned with you before, and that is that design has been very fortunate because it has a ref category in England. Uh, systems have never had a ref category, so therefore it's never had to address some of the issues you uh, alluded to. But we've now got a systems thinking practitioner apprenticeship recognized in, in um, England and with a dozen or more providers presenting this master's level apprenticeship. Uh, and the numbers of students in work are doing it growing all the time. So it is growing into a recognized form of. of practice, systems thinking practitioner as a professional role in organizations. One final point, I don't want to hold all the time, but the, Mike sort of skirted around this, and he and I have never had a proper conversation about it, but um, I see one of the key issues within the systems community, the distinction and the commitment a practitioner makes as to whether to see system as a noun or a thing or as an ontology. If you see it as a noun, a thing or an ontology, then you can model it, objectively describe it, use it in everyday language and not ask the question, who, who has brought forth, distinguish the system, who's made boundary judgments, one of the particular dynamics I imagine that are going on inside the system. So the ontological thing framing hides all of those elements. 
Whereas if you see systems thinking as being really adept and engaging with situations which are uncertain, complex, problematic, contested, where power is replete, then the, the design of a challenge is to bring forth or to design a system of interest as an epistemological device which can change or affect a different make a difference in those situations of concern. So it becomes a device for your practice and for transformation. It doesn't become a thing in the world. And these are distinctions that have plagued the systems community, particularly in agricultural science, the background of farming and rural development and uh, development contexts, and will continue to play in the academia while ever those distinctions are not uh, made acknowledged and individual practitioners take responsibility for their own commitments around those distinctions. That's great, thank you. Um, probably Rebecca uh, maybe you can talk about how to move forward as a, as a more personal kind of a situation as a associate uh, or the vice chancellor or on your role. So mm -hmm. any 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 thought, I mean you can apply for research and education, but actually in your daily job, but then any there is any way you can move forward. Yeah, so I think um, one of the biggest challenges we face in the in the university, and I'm sure this is common to many universities, is when we're thinking around how to create vibrant and inclusive communities, kind of what, what that means and who gets to decide who those communities are and, and who's in and who's out and how do they form. Um, so there's a lot of work to do around kind of positionality, I think, and um, people in leadership roles and how they um, acknowledge their role within these systems as well. Um, I think it's a, a sort of enormous structural kind of problem. <laughs> if you take research, for example, we've all got ambitions to want to do more with other disciplines and to, and to kind of work on transdisciplinary projects. And I think to a certain extent in research, people who are self-starting can make that happen. They can go and find people that they want to work with and they can go and find communities. I think where it's really challenging is with education because it's organizationally inconvenient <laughs> to try and mix disciplines together. Uh, you know, people in the university will go, how would we timetable that, for example? You know, so quite quite quickly it can be broken down by just the, how do you operationalize this in practice? So then you start to see kind of extracurricular thing popping up, I think, where people can start to work in a transdisciplinary way. But there's a huge journey to go on to get it, I think, embedded in the curriculum. And um, so what we're doing at the university here is we have a new university strategy. Um, and it has three key themes as part of it. So the first one is vibrant and inclusive communities. The second one is climate change and net zero. And the third one is sport, health and well-being. Because if you don't know that, it doesn't want sport. <laughs> um, so by sort of channeling things through those themes, and each theme is headed up by two associate very vice chancellors, so I, I have a, a, a counterpart as well. Um, we're kind of able to start to convene activity across campus, um, and whether that's across research or whether it's across education or, or communities as well. Um, I think it's interesting because a lot of us are on a sort of a journey with this, and, and what I've seen coming into kind of um, kind of junior senior level positions in the university, if you like. Is that people don't really know what transdisciplinarity is, and, and actually there's quite an education piece to do to explain what it is. It's not just combining disciplines together, it's actually about that external engagement, about co-creation, and so there's a lot of opportunity it may to start to try and create these spaces and places where people can do the types of things which will get those ambitions realized. That's kind of a, a predefined question, but let's just check some of the questions uh, raised by um, some of the audience here. Um, I think this is an uh, interesting question um, about, um, about whether we train experts to have a system thinking, I mean, experts in certain field to have a system thinking, or teach system thinker to become expert in the field. Which one is more effective? Or better both? Or, uh, well, the, the systems and cybernetic and complexity fields is a huge field. There's, there's no, to my knowledge, there's no academic group anywhere in the world that teaches a full curriculum on what I think is available is possible. 
we we go some way towards it, but it's uh, still very narrow in reality. Uh, so uh, I. Mike has a phrase which I've used often, and that is that systems is, is a, the handmade, that's just an appropriate metaphor, uh, handmade into other disciplines. Uh, and so, therefore, it should be used, it has a, it should be studied in its own right to be used as a way of orchestrating and at a meta level the relationships and dynamics between other uh, areas. Uh, my own view is that. Uh, to really engage with systems thinking requires discipline, but it is at a meta level transdiscipline, and you can equate it with mathematics if you want, although mathematics doesn't carry with it the theory of change. Okay. I'm some questions from Rebecca then. Okay, we have a UX design program in, the, in our school, and which is really popular. But do we have to create systemic design programs? <laughs> Yeah, I've been pondering this. I I personally think that you kind of need to embed it across things. And I'm not just in a design school. I think if systemic design is going to um, claim its place in the world, it probably needs to get out of the design school and, and, and kind of reach across other disciplines as well. But I think the important thing is to think about, you know, what's the end point here? You know, who, who are the types of people that we're trying to create? And you know, not to get too hung on the labels and what they're called, but do they have the skills to negotiate, to facilitate, to build relationships, to visualize, and, and, and how do you embed that in whatever form? The, the, the open university when it was designed was designed for people to give people a second chance who didn't have an opportunity to get, to get involved in higher education. And they created a curriculum with foundation courses that, in the first year. The foundation courses were constructed as interdisciplinary and collaborative efforts in particular faculties. And all the students had to do two foundation courses because they, it was argued they needed to understand two particular ways of engaging and knowing about the world. And uh, my view was that they were very successful, highly successful, and they were a way of embedding an appreciation of systems thinking across the whole of the university. But under pressure from students who wanted us to become more degree orientated, these were stopped and we lost a tremendous uh, opportunity and a tremendous happen. So, I mean, probably in the healthcare context, we have the same question about whether we have to invite system thinker into healthcare. We have to train doctors and nurses to be our system thinker. We do both, but as Ray point out, we need you know this you know very little scholarship and then this thing. So then it's we need a system thinker or uh, uh, looking at uh, healthcare, but also build on some knowledge in the healthcare people who can actually work with us. So the build both we need there. Um, um, and also there's some comments about there is a good practice in system education that alternative providers like Schumacher CAT on the CAT um, and Open University is also named as uh, alternative providers. Um, um, and anyone here, uh, audience, want to ask questions? Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Thomas. Would you like to come here and then use the microphone? I can fit that in brief. I'm just going to be a kind of right now. <laughs> oh, yes. Thank you. Um, Testing, yes. Um, Thomas, I've got a question for you. Um, so as you know, um, I do healthcare research um, and I'm also a clinician. Um, so when I'm working in NHS, I really appreciate systems thinking because I don't blame myself most of the time for things going wrong. And pre-systems thinking era, I did. And I thought I was incompetent. Um, but now I feel, like, oh, actually, no, this is why this has happened. Um, but that's when I'm a clinician. When I'm doing research and trying to apply that systems thinking with other clinicians, I often face challenges. Um, and I just wanted to ask, how do you overcome those challenges? Um, because healthcare staff are happy with systems thinking. But the minute you say, oh, we're going to redesign something, they just kind of back down and they're not as interested. 
Um, so that was my question. And my question is evidenced by things like they've got we've got um human factors in um healthcare as a mandatory module, we've got PISA for incident investigation. So we are making changes from a systems perspective. But how do we overcome that challenge of actually saying systems thinking works in healthcare with clinicians? Was a simple answer is you can't please everybody, make friends, and then work with them. <laughs> that's that's the only way. I mean, you can just make more friends, and then and then whoever understands where you're coming from, and then work with them, build trust, and then small projects, and then making big projects later on. So that's how I did, and then it works. <laughs> Any other um, question? I'm just checking some of the questions here, which. Uh, Anna, Anna is here. Yeah, okay. Um, I might challenge using subject teaching inclusiveness assembly. Um, could you say? Uh, yes, yeah. yeah, so I guess that it, it, it currently happens like in organizations as well, where you have like certain projects targeting um, sustainability or inclusiveness. And it's like, it seems like it's something siloed. And often what happens um, there is that like students tend to believe that those type of subjects are, you know, are not as relevant as their ones in their degree. Um, and sometimes they don't, they don't even put like the effort in because they believe it's like complementary. Um, so if we do that in education, wouldn't be, wouldn't we be perpetuating this understanding that these type of things can be siloed when in fact they should have they should be embedded. Um well I'll pick up on that. I mean if I compare the two universities in Australia, is that where systems was designed into the curriculum, it was absolutely central to the program systems agriculture. And it was a really vibrant uh, community, a, a vastly different community where we as academics saw ourselves not as dispensers of knowledge, but facilitators of learning on our students. So a lot of group-based work, facilitation, uh, managing for emergence, those sorts of ideas. Uh, and um, the an action research process whereby we actually researched with the students. We gave students autonomy to help co-design in the days before co-design was a popular term, uh, the curriculum, and we adhered to those Outcomes. So if I go to the University of Sydney, a traditional university, uh, lectures and other things like that, and if I try to be systemic in my part of the curriculum, then the students largely ignore me because this is seen as Ray Eisen is a bit of an oddball and he's doing something different, and that's really not serious. So there's that sort of issue, uh, which I think uh, we have to deal with. And, and this is just, just one other point about design. After being at the AU for a while, I realized that after meeting many of our students and alumni, that we were too often setting our students up to fail back in their workplace when they finished studying with us. And why were we doing that? Well, people got excited, they got really enthusiastic. They went back to their workplace and people got sick of their enthusiasm. All the the um, all the rules of the game back there were not conducive to enacting systems ideas. So I felt we had a discussion about this because I felt it was ethically not defensible to put people in a way to fail. Uh, because I heard many reports of people leaving jobs and all sorts of things. So we now. Uh, Inculcating to our students the idea of taking a design turn in their practice, which is not only about developing systems practice, but designing the context to enact systems practice. And there are more questions, but I think we covered a little bit, but also, okay, uh, we um, uh, we will have a further conversation over dinner and things like that. But before we finish, I'll pass the mic. Uh, uh, well, no, <laughs> okay. I was going to ask a question. Ray, do you know Gabriel, obviously you know Gabriel Bowman, 
I think it's quite a big initiative at the university. She's up, which I can't remember which one it is to introduce transdisciplinary work. There's an initiative in yeah, there's, the, there's an initiative at the Australian National University in Canberra, uh, which is a, um, it's the first new school within that university for about 20 years. It's a new school of cybernetics set up with a special appointment of a professor uh, returning Australian who had spent much of her life in Silicon Valley, et cetera. So whilst it's called a school of cybernetics, it's actually much broader than the word cybernetics. I mean, I would call it a school of uh, cyber systemics because it's about systems and cybernetics and complexity. And it's it's um, had a very significant investment. It's doing some quite exciting stuff. I've met with their students a few times. And is, is that the one that Gabriel was involved? No, she's on a different path. But the, it's a big initiative in her place as well. They set up the cross university body to establish where it would come in the curriculum. That's to do with implementation science, presumably. Yeah. Presumably, there's a mix of things. Systems is in there, implementation science. There's an initiative in Columbia, ex old student who now president of the university to do, to do that. These things are just incredibly difficult to make them work. Um, I mean, I tried it, I was involved in it, but I tried to at Hull. Uh, and you start off with huge ambition. And gradually, what you intend gets watered down and watered down. And when so called curriculum 2020 emerges in, uh, in 2023, it's nothing like you hoped for at the, at the beginning. The disciplines have reinforced their position. Uh, people teach, uh, and people, you know, they fight so hard to teach what they've been teaching for 20 years, basically. I know this is common knowledge to all of us, but it's worth saying how difficult it is to. Make this kind of initiative work, but let's hope there's going to there's, there's going to be more and more of it. And it certainly requires changes in the curriculum and way people are taught. It also requires students to get out there and do things in in, in practice, and that's equally difficult for universities to to grasp and to uh, and, and to actually implement. That's really a good can point. I, can I have? <laughs> so, because I think there should be the path, because I think that the discussion is still what happened inside an institution. And when we talk about transdisciplinary, it's also about learning from those marginalized points. And we say that. So, any action in practice that you have for really reach and learn from them, because I think we are limited as educators and students, limit ourselves with the concept of the world by just doing what we know is. One and what is part of the world that we work in the public sense. How we put it. So, could you learn from the vulnerable part of society? That the people that it's not attached to traditional education, just to say in a different way. Um, so I can, I can say that it's definitely an ambition within the theme that I'm looking at. So we have a plan to, to create the WA University Institute coming on board in the next few years, which will very much have um, local community as part of it. So and um, not just because we don't do research on communities, we do this group and they will be involved in the co-creation of what that institute needs to be. So that, that concrete action, but there are some directions and change hopefully things happen. So that's true. <laughs> Sorry. Really. So um, um, thank you very much for your uh, so, uh, you know, participation and thank you for questions and thank you for the whole day actually uh, just being with us and then, then asking and then learning together. Um, so let's finish this session with a big round of course with two yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we will typically talk about the uh, plan for this evening. Those who sign up for dinner, then she will talk about uh, what's going to happen, but also tomorrow.